Hi, y'all. Let's talk a little bit about the Trump administration's win in the Supreme Court. I'm sorry, the partial win in the Supreme Court, as goes the story. If you will recall, my last video last month was about the travel ban and what I think the proper role of the courts is. I buttressed my argument by quoting from, or uh, not really quoting, paraphrasing from the dissent out of uh, the Ninth Circuit where the judges who were dissenting from the decision to deny a rehearing on bank went through some case law and uh, pointed out very politely the manifest errors of the lower courts in the Ninth Circuit, the panel from the Ninth Circuit and the district court. As a technical matter, the way it works is you go to the district court and you either win or lose. If you lose, you can appeal to a panel of the, uh, of the circuit. And that panel will render a decision which binds all the other panels in that circuit unless and until the Supreme Court overrules them, obviously, or there's a rehearing on bank and the on bank court uh, decides that the panel was incorrect and reverses that decision. Otherwise, it stands as the circuit precedent and uh, the other panels in the circuit aren't free to uh, ignore. They must take it into account. Although in the Ninth Circuit, they kind of do whatever they want, notwithstanding what the law might uh, otherwise command them to do. That's why it's called the Ninth Circus. They just do whatever they want. Anyway, and they were quoting from some various uh, cases that, that exist in the, in the Supreme Court and even some circuit cases, but putting the circuit cases off to the side because they don't really matter. What matters here is Supreme Court precedent because that's the nationwide policy uh, in respect of our common law tradition. And some of the same cases that these judges brought up miraculously appeared in the Supreme Court's per curiam decision this week, almost like there are these things like laws of the land and decisions of the Supreme Court that the lower courts are just not free to ignore, even in the Ninth Circus. So um, let me read a short excerpt from the dissent from the rehearing on bank and from uh, what the administration wanted out of the Supreme Court when it petitioned. Uh, what the Supreme Court actually did, and where I think this is going to go next. So the Ninth Circuit, in a, in the, uh, from the dissenting judges, write that, uh, as I said in my last video, there is a limited role for the judiciary in these decisions, but it's crafted by statute, and beyond that, there's not much for them to really do. Uh, this is not to say that the presidential immigration policy concerning the entry of aliens at the border is immune from judicial review, only that our review is limited by Kleindienst, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, versus Mandel, a 1972 case, and that the panel held that limit limitation inapplicable. I dissent from our failure to correct the panel's manifest error. Um, the administration wanted, uh, this is from the per, per curiam decision discussing what the administration wants from the Supreme Court uh, based off of their petition, uh, and the administration's position is the court instead should have upheld Executive Order 2, this is about the Fourth Circuit, but the dissents are the same, uh, the dissenting reasoning is the same, uh, should have, I'm sorry, the court instead should have upheld Executive Order 2 because it rests on the quote, facially legitimate and bona fide, end quote, justification of protecting national security, Kleindienst versus Mandel. In addition, the Fourth, Circuit, uh, the Fourth Circuit erred by focusing on the President's campaign trail comments to conclude that Section 2C, religiously neutral on its face, nonetheless has a principally religious purpose. At the very least, the government argues, the injunction is too broad. Supreme Court, in, uh, in their order, we now turn to the preliminary injunctions barring enforcement of the Section 2C entry suspension. If you recall, that's the one I was just discussing from what the administration is appealing about. Uh, we grant the government's applications to stay the injunctions to the extent the injunctions would prevent enforcement of Section 2C with respect to foreign nationals who lack any bona fide relationship with a person or entity in the United States. And then, uh, slightly different order for the parts of the injunctions that uh, don't deal, I mean, they deal with people who do have a bona fide relationship. But anyway, uh, this is actually a, pretty much a total win for the president uh, because they have. In effect, they haven't adopted the view of the dissenting judges from the Ninth Circuit, Ninth Circuit because that's not what they were reviewing. Uh, but the administration's position and the dissenting judges' uh, position, in a lot of ways, mirror each other for obvious reasons. I mean, the law is the law. It, look, there, it's what it says. Bada bing, bada boom. Read it and weep. And now the judges in that circuit are reading it and weeping. Anyway. Uh, but the general thrust of it is that uh, the stay the Supreme Court has entered is, the, is a statement from the court that while not definitively resolving the merits, 
is saying that in order to issue it, it's very likely that the uh, that the government will prevail on the merits if uh, when the uh, oral argument is heard in the fall. This is in contradiction of what uh, the various judges in the majority and the uh, district court had said about how, in that case, the plaintiff's the one whining about the immigration ban or the travel ban or whatever you want to call it, uh, were saying that they, the, the complainers, would be the ones who are likely to prevail on the merits. There is no legal justification whatever for that position. It is quite clear um, that it is a plenary power, as, well, as I covered in my last video, go watch it. The, the power is plenary. The Congress and the President have these powers, they're reposed there. The role for the judiciary is, is not non-existent, but it's very slight uh, on a constitutional standpoint. From a statutory standpoint, the Congress is free to empower the courts uh, in all kinds of different ways, which it has, uh, you know, there are immigration courts and there's a review in the district court and blah, blah, blah. But the, the prime mover here is the executive. Anyway, the uh, dissenting judges, the first case they cited on why uh, this decision should not stand as one I just quoted from. But before that, they were given a little bit of background on the impropriety of the lower courts, the panel and the, the district court, relying on the president's um, various statements and his tweets and all these other things. And if you recall from what I read from the, the procurium decision from the Supreme Court, the injunction, I should say, the stay of the injunction, I should say, whatever the hell you want to call it, uh, they're, pretty much, they're pretty much adopting the dissent's view there, saying that... Um, you know, the government is here appealing, saying that the, the Fourth Circuit, like the Ninth, was wrong to rely on these tweets, to, on these various statements that the president has made. You have to look at the law, uh, look at the order that is actually written, and go with that. And the Supreme Court upheld that part of the injunction. And uh, remember, uh, I'm sorry, didn't uphold it. They imposed the stay, stopping the injunction from being enforced, uh, because it's very likely that the administration will... will uh, prevail on the merits, which is to say that the lower courts, like the dissent in the Ninth Circuit pointed out, are wrong to look at that. They need to look at uh, not the, the offhand comments of the president, however stupid or smart they may be, but look at what the actual order is or the actual law is, if it's a congressional thing, read it, and then go with that, which is precisely how laws should be interpreted, not the... Uh, anyway. <clears throat> now, what do I think is going to happen in the future? It's very curious. I mentioned this on Twitter when the Supreme Court first took it up and ordered expedited uh, briefing, and I, it's a very expedited schedule. And I was wondering, I mean, it obviously means that the Supreme Court is taking this seriously because major policy has been stopped by a district court and whatnot. Um, but I was thinking about it, and then I looked at, uh, back at the executive order, and it had a date certain on it, which is to say that it had a... a 90, 90, uh, in 90 days from this date, X will happen. And I was wondering about that, but then the president, as noted in the procuring decision, decided to change the dates to 90 days after a stay of the injunction. Anyway, so I was wondering where this is going. I mean, they're trying to beat the clock out here. They're going to have to get really quick on this. this is it going to be a, uh, a procurium just vacating it entirely? What's, what's the strategy of the Supreme Court here? And so they issued their stay. And then they set briefings more than 90 days in the future from when they issued the stay. Which means that the Supreme Court, because of the schedule it has chosen, not the schedule that the President has chosen, because the Supreme Court could hold a, an extraordinary hearing sometime before October. Uh, they could GVR this. I mean, there are lots of things they could do, but they have decided to set the date in October, which is more than 90 days from the effective date of, uh, of the order, when the review, internal review is supposed to start happening. It's important that this is a decision by the Supreme Court when to set its argument date, not a decision by the administration because it affects the posture and the disposition of the case in a very uh, substantial way because of a, of a doctrine known as Munsingware, uh, I'm sorry, Munsingware vacator, which is to say, uh, what this case says that if a case becomes moot while it is on appeal or while a decision is pending in the Supreme Court, uh, the practice of that court is to vacate the lower court's holdings, whatever they may be. It's not an expression of any views on the merits, but it does dispose, uh, it wipes away, it wipes the slate clean, it disappears, magics into nothingness, all of the work of the lower courts, because the case was prematurely pretermitted without having had a chance to definitively resolve the case on its merits. 
There are some exceptions to it, like people can't game the system. Uh, the president hasn't gamed the system. After all, he has not chosen when the Supreme Court will take up the case. They chose that. Um, they, it can't be because of the action of the party, like if, if they uh, settle the case while it's pending, you know, that might not give rise to it. There, there are some exceptions, but none of them seem to me relevant here, though it is an equitable ruling, which means that, you know, you can, if you're a judge, you can, eh, which, yeah, what are we going to do today? And I think what the Supreme Court wants to do is it wants to reestablish its precedent about how this is you know, primarily for the political branches to resolve, but it doesn't want to have to get into the merits if it doesn't have to, and it doesn't have to by setting the case up in this administrative posture where they can issue a stay, set, hear, set a hearing for, uh, sorry, set an argument date, which never has to actually occur. And it's interesting to note that in the procuring decision itself, they actually ordered the parties to brief what effect, if any, mootness might have on the disposition of this case, on, on the posture of this case. I think it's going to wind up having a significant uh, disposition uh, if it ever comes to oral argument. Now, if it does, the Supreme Court, because it's the Supreme Court and it can, you know, it's an equitable rule, it can get around it. And if it really wants to get into the, into the merits of this to really smack down the lower courts, then it's free to do that. But no matter what happens, uh, how they, do, they choose to dispose of this case, one thing is abundantly clear. The administration is going to win all day long. It is a long, unbroken line of cases for centuries that uh, this is for the political branch. Immigration policy, naturalization, these things are primarily for the political branches. The role of the judiciary is very slight, and it is not the proper role of the judiciary to go around engaging in political philosophy, even though the Supreme Court does it itself. But, you know, I guess it can break its own rules and, you know, the king can do no wrong, whatever. Uh, it's not proper for them to be looking at campaign rhetoric or political speeches. They need to look at the legislation. And, more importantly, the Supreme Court likes to make sure that the lower courts actually obey its decision for the same reason that the uh, appeal, the panels like to protect their own decisions. And the same reason Congress like to protect, likes to protect its power. Uh, now, all these groups have no problems whatever derogating other people's power, but they do protect their own. Um, if you look at the way the Supreme Court interprets uh, restrictions on common law doctrines, those restrictions, the Supreme Court says, shall be uh, narrowly construed. Narrowly construed. It's very important that, that whenever the uh, Congress decides to amend a common law rule, uh, circumscribe it, whatever it is, that the work of the legislature will be given its narrowest interpretation. But when it comes to the courts, dealing with remedial statutes, then those are to be liberally construed. So when it comes to the court meddling in the work of the Congress, then that is by the lower courts to be liberally construed. So the question there is, what is a remedial statute? Well, I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, if you ask the question a different way, it, it answers itself. What is not a remedial statute? I don't know of any statute that's just been enacted all willy-nilly because people were bored that day on the hill and decided, hey, Circle around, everybody. I've got a great idea. Let's pass a law for no particular reason. It'll have no goal, no aims. Everything is a remedial statute. People enact laws to restrict things or to compel actions to solve a problem that, of the day. That is why legislatures act, or a potential problem. So, really the rule is, listen, Congress, whenever you mess with our power, we're going to give you... The narrow, we're going to constrain you as much as we possibly can get away with doing, but when you mess with us, well, we're going to liberally construe how it is that we're going to uh, deal with your work, which is to say that, that uh, we're, we're going to, uh, to make sure that our own work has the broadest possible reach, while your attempts to, to curtail us will have the shortest possible reach. And so, too, is there a derogation of Congress in respect to the President? But this is part and, uh, part and parcel of the checks and balances of the system. You have one, one source of power that's going to, one faction essentially is going to push up against another. You have another faction that's going to push back, a third faction that's going to try to balance them. And then you have the states that are, you have their interests, and you have the citizens who have their interests, which may be different from the other four things I just mentioned. But in all of this, the one ineluctable conclusion 
is that uh, the panel in the Ninth Circuit was dead wrong. The district court in the, in the Ninth Circuit was dead wrong. There is no legal justification whatever for uh, the, the bulk of what has happened in, in the various circuits in respect of enjoining the president. Now it's interesting because tonight an emergency application for a state, or I'm sorry, for a clarification has been filed with the original district judge in the Ninth Circuit uh, by you know, some whiners. I think Neil Cattial is on it, but whatever. Uh, so it's interesting because what, what's happening now is the injunction, the stay of the injunction has been issued. Uh, the work of the lower courts has been pretty much just set aside. The uh, president's, uh, the administration's going ahead with its uh, travel ban. And now some people are running into court in the Ninth Circuit to the original judge who got all this shit started, who got smacked down, not, uh, not rudely, but very forcefully uh, by the Supreme Court, having to make a decision about uh, the implementation of the policy. I, I don't know why some people were expecting that, that judge tonight to issue an emergency uh, stay. I didn't, I didn't think that was going to happen, and it has not happened. And it would be unwise for that judge to do so. He, his work has just been undermined utterly by the Supreme Court. And uh, I don't think that he's going to be much in, in the mood of rushing headlong into another opportunity to be told by the Supreme Court, yet again, judge, you are not following the law. Now, here's, here's the, the catch. I mentioned this earlier. It's a stay which means it does not definitively resolve the merits of the case. Uh, all, it, all it says is that the administration is likely to succeed on the merits. Another way to, point, to, to put that is, as I've alluded to, the, uh, it's, the Supreme Court unanimously is of the view that the Ninth Circuit and the District Court are uh, likely to be wrong in their reasoning, and that the whiners, I mean the petitioners, the complainants in the original action, are highly unlikely to succeed on the merits, notwithstanding the, the uh, much ballyhooed attestation from the, the circuit courts that actually these whiners are likely to succeed on the merits, completely without justification. And, uh, and I'll just say this as, a, as a, an observer of the Supreme Court, I can't recall the last time uh, that it went to the, uh, to, that a say went to merits and the Supreme Court decided, oh yeah, it turns out when we said it was likely to succeed on the merits, we were wrong. That just doesn't happen. When they say it's likely to succeed on the merits, uh, you, go in, you go into the oral argument, if you're the, the person who's gotten the stay, knowing you're in a pretty good position, and knowing that this case is actually yours to lose. You're not certain to win. You're probably going to win. Uh, but you're pretty certain you're not going to lose. Although, if you screw the pooch, you can still, uh, you can still snatch snatch a defeat from the jaws of victory, whereas if you're the person who has, who is, whose work has been stayed, you go in knowing this is a pretty lost cause. Boy, I sure hope my, my, my opponent is really, really bad today. Please be really bad today, because I'm going to need it, because I am staring defeat right in the face. It, I'm sure it happens. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but if it does happen, it's rare. Uh, when, when they say there's an injunction issued, I'm sorry, a stay of an injunction issued, it pretty much resolves the case, and particularly when they set it up in the posture such as they have, where now that the stay has been issued, the 90 days will be completed, there will really not be a lot to litigate, it will be moot, and that gives them the opportunity to smack down all of the lower courts without having to get into the weeds. And uh, it's interesting to note, and I'll just highlight this one more time, that when they issued the injunction, they agreed with the administration and the by proxy the dissent in the Ninth Circuit, that it is not the proper role of the judiciary to be sitting around, reading Twitter, listening to campaign speeches, and trying to morph that into the legal merits of the case. This is a big win for the administration. All right, uh, uh, and by the way, me too, since my position all along has been that the administration, wise or unwise, was fully within its rights to issue the executive order in its entirety. Um, it, 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 it's a plenary power. It can act for bad reasons, it can act for noble reasons, stupid reasons. The, the point about power is you can act. Wisely or unwisely, it is the ability to act or to abstain from acting. And that is something that is committed to the political branches. The American people don't like it. The resolution for the American people and, the, and people around the world who are adversely affected 
uh, by proxy is at the ballot box, not in, not in a court. All right, have a great day.